Thank you for that introduction. It's wonderful to be here at the Threefold Communities Auditorium, where I sat back there a number of times as a uh, listener in the audience to some of the most amazing speakers. Many great people have spoken here, and I'm very humbled to be now on this stage in speaking to all of you. And tonight we'll talk about Renaissance art, or I should say the flowering of Renaissance art. You see, Renaissance artists try to use their paintings to help to develop in the viewers and in themselves what Steiner called imagination. They did this through their art. Such paintings are full of symbolism and esoteric content. In this hour-long talk, we're going to tour what three Renaissance painters had to say about the human being. And just as an aside, it's interesting that there are many great Renaissance painters, but these three stand out. And we might ask, in other centuries or periods of human evolution, who are the three that stand out? And when I think of the Baroque music period, there's Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart, and many other great musicians and composers at that time. But um, it's just an aside, it might be something that could create for a very interesting study for someone. But let's proceed here with our topic for tonight. And to place us all on the same ground, I'll read a short quote from the final lecture of the Temple Legend Cycle by Rudolf Steiner. This was the 2nd of January, 1906. If you wish to understand present day culture and immerse yourself in it, you will find that it divides into three realms, the realm of wisdom, the realm of beauty, and the realm of strength. The whole extent of spiritual culture is in fact contained in these three words. I'll say that again, the whole extent of spiritual culture is in fact contained in these three words. Therefore, they are known as the three pillars of human culture. And as an aside, breaking from Steiner's quote, if you do a search on the internet for three pillars, uh, you'll find that many of the Masonic lodges not only refer to Yakum and Boaz as the two pillars. Um, they are, these three pillars, are the same as the three kings in Goethe's fairy tale, the green snake and the beautiful lily, namely the gold king, the silver king, and the brass king. It is connected with Freemasonry being called the royal art. Today, these three realms are separated from each other. Wisdom is essentially contained in what we call science. Beauty is essentially embodied in what we call art. And what in Freemasonry terms is known as strength is contained in the regulated and organized living together of humanity in the state, end quote. So religion, art, and science, they were once one. By the fifth century, they had necessarily separated. In this, the age of the consciousness soul, we must work to attain once again their unity. At the start of this age, three great artists arose who individually represented one of these, respectively, wisdom, beauty, or strength. Born on the 15th of April, 1452, and he died on the 2nd of May, 1519, Leonardo da Vinci was the illegitimate son of a notary, illegitimate but beloved by his father, who provided for his early education. 
At eight, he was enrolled in a school in Florence. At 12, he had been promoted to the best artistic workshop, that is, of Andrea del Verrocchio, where many other famous Renaissance artists got their training, including Botticelli, Girondio, Perugino, Lorenzo de Creti, and many others. In 1481, he abandons his masterpiece known as the Adoration of the Magi. Why? I believe he did so because he received an initiation at the Platonic Academy in his 30th year. His initiation taught him about Christ and more. He realized that his church-based religious education was not the full truth. He immediately began his Virgin of the Rocks, and we'll look into this a little more, but while working on this, he had to leave Florence for the relative safety of Milan, and we'll talk more about that. He could foresee that the rise of religious fundamentalism and an individual known as Savonarola would lead to upheavals of his beloved Florence. Did being left-handed play a role in him becoming the great master? Rudolf Steiner says of Leonardo, quote, we can say that he bore within him the whole spirit of his age, and yet, he was often misunderstood or out of sync with his time precisely because he was already working out of the depths of the spirit, making use of powers that were only to emerge in later centuries, end quote. That's from GA 292. And Raphael bears the healer's name, Raphael, of course, born on the 6th of April, 1483, and that was a Good Friday. He would later die also on Good Friday and his birthday at the age of 37. He learned art as a child from his father, Giovanni Santi. At 16, he was apprenticed to Perugino. Amazingly, already at 25, he was called by the Pope to Rome. It is said he was beloved by all. Not so well known is that he studied with Leonardo da Vinci when Leonardo returned to Florence around the year 1500, and he did for a couple years. It's also interesting that Raphael dies at such a young age, I mentioned 37, and that it was on his birthday, which happened to have been Good Friday in 1520, and that would have been the 6th of April. Rudolf Steiner spoke about Raphael being the reincarnation of Lazarus, who had become, after his public initiation, renamed himself John because of his experience of John of the beheaded, John the Baptist, during his period of initiation. Steiner shared that this initiation of Lazarus enabled this beheaded John the Baptist to work with and through this individuality, not only in that incarnation, but in his future incarnations as Raphael and then as Novalis. Michelangelo will be our third artist that we study tonight. He lived from March 6, 1475 to February 18, 1564. As fate would have it, Michelangelo was able to become an artist because of his family's descent from being minor nobility to more commoner status. He is universally considered a genius, not only in painting, but also in sculpture and architecture, which he took up later in life. 
He was apprenticed to Gerilyn Dio. He finished his training in just one of the three years normal. He was then taken up by Lorenzo de' Medici in 1490. Note that Leonardo da Vinci had left Florence for Milan in 1482, eight years prior. Because of the overthrow of the Medici in 1494, then Michelangelo moved to Bologna and then to Rome in 1496. His path to fame was through sculpture. His Pieta in Rome was finished in 1498 and his David in Florence in 1501. In 1501, as you recall me saying, was when Leonardo had returned to Florence due to the war with France in and around Milan. So I wonder, did Michelangelo also attend the trainings that Leonardo offered in Florence that were attended by Raphael? Because it's interesting, Michelangelo takes up painting at this time. And he begins with a series of Madonnas. Many art historians mention him as the inspirer of mannerism. Mannerism is this extending the reality of, say, fingers to bring about a certain um, awareness of the viewer to certain qualities, um, soul qualities, perhaps, that uh, the artist wished to express. He is best known for painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, and he did this starting in 1508 and finished in 1512. Now back to Leonardo, who is credited with developing to perfection the technique of sfumato. It is a blending and vanishing, causing harsh lines and edges to fade away, a kind of softening transitions between colors and edges, between light and dark tones, so that there are no hard edges. The result is a very smooth appearance. Leonardo describes sumato technique as without lines or borders in the manner of smoke or what's beyond the picture plane. I will mention, but we're not going to go into other artistic techniques of that time that Leonardo was well aware of. And I won't even try to pronounce them, but there's other techniques. But it's important for us to recognize in this time of these three artists, and especially important for somebody like Leonardo, that there was not only an active inquisition, but there were other fundamentalist groups that Savonarola, uh, and his first name is uh, Girolamo Savonarola, that these fundamentalist groups looked at what was happening in Renaissance art as something that was not fit for Christianity. It was called vain art and Savonarola inspired mobs to gather up what was considered vain art and destroy it by burning it in the town square. Knowing that this had happened in other places before Savonarola arrived in Florence could be a reason why Leonardo left for Milan in 1482. We know that the Inquisition began to route, to root out the remaining sympathizers for the Cathars. We know that Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake for his cosmology, his view that the sun is at the center of the solar, of, you know, of the solar system, that there is a solar system even. And, and he was burned in the year 1600, so nearly a century later. 
And so obviously the inquisition in the time of these three artists is very strong and something to be very concerned about. However, there were also a number of secret schools. There were Rosicrucians, Kabbalists. Um, there had been the Templar Knights, and there may have still been remains of that. Um, it certainly seems that they flowed into Freemasonry. And we can even say that the Academia Platonica itself was a kind of secret school that had its public face as well. And we know that Leonardo da Vinci, when he moved to Milan, started an academy in the methods and style of the Academy of Platonica of Florence. And here, Plato was studied along with geometry and many other important um, uh, parts of mathematics and, and sacred geometry were studied. So we, we can say that these artists were asking the question, what is the human being? Interestingly, this is a question of our modern times as we face the deployment of artificial intelligence. We should ask, how differently would an artist today depict the creation and evolution of the human being than what Michelangelo conceived here? Well, here is a sketch of our current view from the Smithsonian. Not very artistic, but this is what is viewed today, or I should say a few years ago, because this is probably more the view of today um, from this cartoonist. We can ask, can transhumanists possibly be correct about our human evolution? What really is the human being? As we know biblically, St. Paul said, we are composed of soma, body, psyche, soul, and pneuma, spirit. Well, what is our soma, our physical body? How might an artist depict the soul of a human being? In ancient Greek times, the human being was known to be body, soul, and spirit. Threefoldness applied to each of these three, thereby reflecting the nine levels of the heavenly hierarchy. And you can see here even the Greek terms for the first six. And then I have the Sanskrit terms for the three aspects of spirit of the future human being. The threefoldness we'll focus on tonight, as you know, it will be wisdom, beauty, and strength. Apparently these three were at the foundation of not only Freemasonry, but also Rosicrucianism and before them, the Knights Templar. Leonardo was a lover of wisdom, of divine wisdom, of the Virgin Sophia. He taught his students through observation to seek Isis, that is the new Isis, the divine Sophia whom we must find if the Christ power that is ours since the mystery of Golgotha is to become alive, completely alive within us. And a little quote here, the eye, the window of the soul is the chief means to appreciate the infinite works of nature. That's from Leonardo. Another quote from Steiner, you can see from the 13th of February, uh, 1913. In regard to the evolution of humanity, 
we must at all times feel able to say to ourselves, all, all development takes its course in such a way that wherever what has been created becomes a ruin. We know that out of the ruins, new life will always blossom forth, end quote. We need to look upon Leonardo as the giant of wisdom upon whose shoulders later scientists and artists stood. Leonardo sowed the seeds for our times. And so you might ask, what was the destruction? What were the ruins? And it, you don't have to look very far because just before this, there was the Black Plague that ravaged Europe, in some places taking as much as 70, 75% of the population, and in all places, 40 to 60%. At age 28, Leonardo was already part of the de' Medici household. This was an important position in those times to have. But he also became a member of the Garden of San Marcos, where he had access to its library of esoteric content. And this also enabled him to go on the garden walks with leading philosophers of his time. There is an odd journal entry in his notebook that says, the Medici made me and the Medici destroyed me. Hmm, could he be referring to the Medici role in bringing him to a form of initiation? Florence at this time was home to many secret schools and Leonardo kept his private life secret. One, sorry, um, we do know about one person um, from the Platonic, Platonic Academy, um, that it would be its head, Marsilio Ficino. And he's a very important figure for these times and translator, as we'll see, of a number of texts. Others that we know about include John Argeral Polis from Constantinople, an Aristotelian, and the philosopher Pico della Mirandola. So we can ask, what did Leonardo learn from these? And we can say that what these people were bringing anew, afresh, at the start of the Renaissance, was knowledge from the ancient mysteries that had been brought to them at this time through the Greek philosophers brought to this area, and we'll go more into that. But we should ask the question, you know, shouldn't people have been excited to learn this stuff and, and see it as wonderful? And you have to realize, that we talked about, about the Inquisition and so on, um, and the Cathars that views different than the Roman church could get you declared to be a heretic. And if that happened, you forfeited your life. So Steiner and historians often point to the rebirth of Greek philosophy at the start of the Renaissance. It's interesting that even Greek artifacts that have been brought to Italy back in Roman times, and then Rome was overrun and defeated and Gothic tribes uh, came in um, that many of these nobody cared about and they had essentially fallen underground. And at this time they were being dug up and redisplayed. But we can also say that one's interest in Greek paganism or its mysticism could lead to your being burned at the pyre. 
This was the fate for many heretics, many unknown to us, only some of the famous ones like Giordano Bruno. Leonardo da Vinci would have had to have been extremely careful to study such things that were present in Florence and likely known to the Medicis. So where did this knowledge and so on come from? Well, there were multiple streams, but I'd like to point us to one in particular, and this is Gamistus Plethon. In 1428, the Byzantine emperor, John VIII, asked Gamistus Plethon how to unify the churches. Perhaps I should remind you that in 1054, the church in Byzantium and the church of Rome had separated. They had excommunicated each other. Now, there had been for a good, you know, almost 400 years, an attempt every once in a while to try to unify these churches. It's interesting that Plethon was a pagan steeped in the ancient mysteries and that the Christian emperor, John VIII, would ask him for help in how to unify the churches. It's because Plethon was considered the wisest man, not only of his empire, but probably of the entire earth. So in 1438, a council to unify the churches was called to happen in Florence. And Plethon was sent as part of the envoys by Emperor John VIII. And while there, he is offering to do lectures, lectures which um, Cosimo de Medici takes him up on this. And these lectures so thrill those that uh, who attended that Cosimo de Medici then feels inspired to found the Academia Platonica. And he puts his chief philosopher Pacino in the position as head of this academy. Now, Plethon developed a large following of students while he's there. He's continued to stay there um, until, oh, I don't think I have the date here. I think it's 1404. Um, and, uh, and, and train or even possibly initiate people, perhaps Ficino. Um, but he certainly inspired Renaissance painters to take up Greek mythology insofar as Greek mythology could be a prelude to Christianity. So these artists looked at these myths and found in them a kind of foreshadowing or even a prophecy of what then became um, New Testament uh, accounts. It's also fascinating to realize that Plethon um, goes in 1404 to found a mystery center in Mystra, Greece, where he lives until 1540. I'm sorry, um, I said 1404, it's 1440. So he is in Florence for a good 40 years training these. Um, and as I just said, at the end of this period of time, he goes to found a mystery center. Now, who could found a mystery center? Only an initiate, only a true hierophant could go and found a mystery center. Not someone just well-versed in it, in its wisdom or knowledge. So not only this, but Look at some of these statements that people said about Plethon. He was a prince among the philosophers. And Ficino called him the second Plato, while the cardinal 
Bessarion of Florence is known to have, and it was written down to have speculated whether Plato's soul was in the body of Plethon. Now, really? That sounds like the transmigration of souls or reincarnation, which was an anathema for Catholicism at this time. And Plethon brought a trunk full of books, including those of Hermes Trismegistus, which was the likely source for Ch Pacino's Orphic system of natural magic. Plethon believed the West had been influenced inappropriately by Arabic or materialistic interpretations of Aristotle. And so he spoke about the differences between not only Plato and Aristotle, but between Aristotle's truth and the uh, reinterpretation of Aristotle through Gandhi Shapur that had come to Europe. So also in 1452 um, was born Girolamo Savran Arola, who was a Dominican friar and preacher. And in 1482, he called for a Christian renewal and he denounced clerical corruption, despotic rule, and the exploitation of the poor. And of course, this made him immensely popular, especially with the rising commoner class. So um, he inspired Flor Florentines to expel the Medici, who had been the rulers of Florence for many decades, and to establish a popular republic. He even went so far as to declare that Florence was to be the new Jerusalem. And with this, he brought a puritanical campaign. Um, and as you've heard, he, he got uh, mobs of Florentine youth to round up vain art and destroy it. And I believe this caused Leonardo to leave for Milan. While in exile, Lorenzo de' Medici in 1492 had died. Um, and in 1495, while Savonarola had been sort of ruling Florence for a few years, the Pope excommunicated him in part because Savonarola refused to send soldiers from Florence to join in a war against France. And because of that view, popular opinion began to turn against him. And the Pope then had Savonarola put under torture to confess. And of course, while under torture, he confessed that he had invented his visions um, that had established him, um, as well as inventing his prophecies. And so because of this, in 1498, he was burned in Florence. And that allowed the Medici to return to power for a while. So we can see why in 1482, Leonardo left Florence for Milan. He accepted the post as the court artist for the Duke of Milan, who was a Muslim. When he travels there, of course, he takes his paintings with him. And this is to keep him safe from the Savonarola mobs, perhaps. And amongst those paintings is his unfinished Virgin of the Rocks. He stays in Milan until the second Italian war in 1499. And he does in part because earlier the French troops had come in and he was building this magnificent statue of a horse and they used it as target practice. So 
he's gone from 1500, uh, he's gone back to Florence until 1506 when he's asked to return under a legal agreement to Milan. And then later he'll return to Florence from where in 1515, he'll be invited to come to Rome uh, where he can't stand it. So in 1516, he accepts a commission from King Francois I of France to become the French chief painter, engineer, and architect. And he dies there at Clouse in France on the 2nd of May, 1519 at the age of 67. The Virgin Mary and child are depicted in the foreground and form a triangle shape with the Magi kneeling in adoration here in this painting that was to have been his masterpiece. Behind them is a semicircle of accompanying figures, including what may be a self-portrait of young Leonardo on the far right. In the background, on the left is the ruin of a pagan building on which workmen can be seen apparently repairing it. On the right are men on horseback fighting in a sketch of a rocky landscape farther back. I also want to point out this gesture that you see here right by the tree in the middle. Um, and we see that gesture in many of Leonardo's sketches and paintings. Now, I also want to point out that there's not just one version of the rocks, but two. And here you see the one in the Louvre and the one in the National Gallery. Look at these two. What do you see as differences in these two paintings? Now, we should ask the question, why were there two? Certainly not because Leonardo had another commission to paint the same painting. That just wasn't done. There were multiple paintings of a particular idea or theme. When it suited the, the teacher in his studio to have the students paint and copy a certain thing like Holy Infants Embracing, which we'll take a look at in just a minute. So there was no reason for two that was common at that time. It certainly wouldn't have been, hey, this painting is going to sell lots. Let's make copies of it. Um, no, it's certainly not for those reasons. But what do you see as differences? And maybe this can lead us to understanding why there are two. So the first thing we'll look at is the hand gesture of the archangel on the right. Notice her colors are different here as well. But in the painting on the left, her hand does not point across to the other child. We also notice that there is a staff on the child on the left. This is known as the staff of John the Baptist. And we also see halos, which are missing on the painting on the right. I mentioned the colors, but we also can see that where she is looking is slightly different. The one on the right, her focus is down. And if you could see what's <laughs> where Lou Paris, those words are, there's a reflecting pool there. And the reflecting pool comes toward us. In a sense, you might say that our soul is that reflecting pool and the archangel needs to look into, because it can't see into the physical, it need, must look into our soul to see what we are seeing in the physical realm. In the other painting on the left at the National Gallery, she is looking and it appears kind of at the base of the staff of that child. It's hard to say exactly where she's looking. Another thing to point out is that the, um, uh, the 
flowers here, the plants, are botanically correct on the one on the right, painted by Leonardo. But on the left, it's rather sloppy, where these flowers, some have five petals and some have six. Leonardo would never have done that. And I also mentioned this um, reflecting pool, but look at the difference in the rocks. The rocks are layered here on the right, whereas they're much puffier and rounded rocks on the left. And um, it's been pointed out that geologically, these on the right are correct, whereas on the left, you wouldn't find rocks like this at, at this where a reflecting pool like this would be. So let's go into the painting a little bit more. We can see that this sleeve is very long, falling long. And sorry about that poison ivy. Um, and uh, so the sleeve acts as kind of curtains for a stage. And he's using this on purpose to have the three hands, three, interesting number. Um, and we might, you know, with body, soul, and spirit, and so on, um, look at the hands in that way. Whereas on the left, there's just the two hands, and the hand of the child is, looks like it's right at the edge, if not outside of those curtains. And if we look at the background, what do you suppose these mean? Now, um, it's called Virgin of the Rocks because of all these rocks in the background. It's been assumed by some art historians that um, this was some sort of cave that they might have been in. Now, these um, circles here uh, around, you might say, two eyes two pictures, and we might say into the past. And the one on the left, you see many rock pillars. And on the right, just one. If we were to say that these pillars represent past or present lives, then the one on the right would mean that that child below it was having its first incarnation, while the one on the left, where if you look closely, you'll see the river of life flowing through these rocks, these pillars, that this child had many lifetimes. And if we uh, assume that has some validity, then it supports what Rudolf Steiner had to say that the, in the Matthew story, the Jesus um, depicts with the coming of the kings, something of the background and reincarnations of the entity known as Zarathustra, where from Luke, this would be the first incarnation of the archetype of the human being that was held back and hence the story of uh, the shepherds, the priestly side of things, the Adam Cadman from Kabbalistic traditions. And in others, he talks about uh, the relationship to Krishna from uh, Hindu backgrounds. So here we see one of the holy infants embracing and um, in this painting uh, by one of Leonardo's students, Luini, you can see the hand gestures around these two children. We'll need to look into this more, but why would one of Leonardo's students paint this holy infants embracing and use the hand gestures that you see coming from Virgin of the Rocks. 
So you can see the same hand gestures, the left hand and the right hands of the Madonna. But now between them are the holy infants embracing. Where else do we see these holy infants embracing? Well, apparently there were as many as 30 versions done by Leonardo and his students during his time in Milan. And other painters came to the studio and painted similar holy infants embracing. Um, and I'm afraid I'm, I can't remember the name of the Flemish artist. Uh, hopefully it'll come to me later, uh, who paints many and taught his students to paint this scene of holy infants embracing. So there's something Steiner's and uh, Steiner, Leonardo is trying to tell us about these holy infants embracing. And here's one of the reasons why. This is by Bernardino de Conti. And here you see the, the two infants that you see in Virgin of the Rocks. The one on the left you see behind that infant royal robes, and you see this kind of golden veil around him. The one on the right is naked and has his hand on the rock element, another important point, and he's raised up a little bit from the one on the left, but who's the one in between? See the staff? It is none other than John the Baptist. Oh my, you should be saying. So then the child on the left here cannot be John the Baptist. And who is it? And obviously, from what I've been telling you, Leonardo knew that the story in Matthew and the story in Luke were two different stories, two different boys named Jesus. Now, we need to know something more about this. And we get a clue by looking at the child on the right who has drilled into his skull three crosses or nails. Why are there three? The three upon Golgotha. What's Golgotha? The place of skulls. So comparing this painting to the Virgin of the Rocks, we see the children in the same poses, but instead of Madonna between them, we have John the Baptist. And John the Baptist's hands are not the same, but similar. There's something that you can say with his right hand on our left is drawing from that one child and with his left hand bestowing on the child on our right. Look at both paintings for a moment and try to see how in both of them, there is a drawing from the one on the left and the bestowing on the one on the right. Where does this picture make more sense? Well, here we get an indication of when this might take place by Bergononi's painting. And here we see the child, the Jesus child at 12, who was left behind in the temple. Behind the child, sitting up on this chair or throne in the temple, you see the curtain behind which is the holy of the holies of the temple. And as you all know, at Golgotha, that curtain was rent in two. But here, before that time, behind that curtain, something dramatic took place. And that's why it's pictured here. And now this boy sitting on the throne is looking at this other boy who is dressed similarly 
but is leaving. And you see his mother Mary and Joseph coming with tears to take him away. This would be the Mary and Joseph from the Matthew book, which would be difficult because we don't know exactly when they moved back from Egypt to Nazareth, but presumably by this time. So they may have accompanied the other family to come down to Jerusalem for the Passover. And both families may have had their boy remain behind, but clearly the other one sitting on the throne with the curtain behind him is going to remain. And here we get further into this. Look closely at this. You see the temple in the background. And we see a crowd around a child who's got a halo with a cross in it. And we see Joseph and Mary coming in from the right. Look at the left. There's a division here. And Jesus is standing in the middle. Let's look in closer at Jesus in the middle. You see the books of wisdom cast on the ground by the doctors as this child knows more than their books. And the child is making a hand gesture. Notice also the figure on your left who's standing there. What kind of gesture does this being have? What do his robes of royal purple and so on suggest to you? Look at the hat he's wearing. Is this a rabbi or someone else? Look at that hand gesture. The two become one. Look at the feet. He's standing on the earth, whereas the child on the left has socks on. He's already lifted off the earth. Look how poor this child is on the left, the child of, of the right of the two on the left, and the other one who is well dressed, whose book is in his hand, and the other one, his book is in some bag, if we can even say it's a book. Are they coming or going or staying? They're obviously going away. And the two became one. Where else do we see that? Luini's other painting, the two become one of the doctors with Jesus. And so Raphael, when he's there in Florence in 1501, paints this. No other Madonna of his paints so many children. And note that all three boys have halos. Isn't that interesting? And notice the gold robe on the child on the right. Where else have we seen that? Well, we have seen it in these holy infants embracing and so on. We've seen this gold when it was the child on the left. And here we see John the Baptist. So that's he, Raphael's telling us he knows something that there were two other holy infants in addition to John the Baptist. And just to point out, a few things. Many art historians have studied this painting that's at the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, um, the Madonna Lita, and it's said to be around 1490, which would mean before the time that Leonardo was back in Florence, if it is 1490. But I would tend to say this was about 
1500 or 1501 because as many art historians are now saying they can see the stroke of Leonardo a left-handed Raphael was right-handed painter and the fact that he has these two windows is very leonardo esque like um, like the two eyes and so on. So it's a lot of debate going on about this painting. So let's take up Raphael now and look at beauty in the paintings of the Renaissance period. This is the Madonna della Segliola and these figures fitting within the curvature of a tondo that's the name of this kind of circular painting, become closely entwined together. This grouping, this closing around the fulcrum of the tondo coincides with the center of affection, the Christ child who depicts our spiritual center as well as the center of this picture. Let's compare his painting to Chimabui, who, as you can see, was 12, well, he, he lived, Chimabui lived from 1240 to 1302. And so painters in the time of Raphael and those schools would have studied Chimabui. Look at the differences in the Madonnas. And she's elevated, as you can see, amongst the angels and below with a floor in between or a ceiling is humanity below. So, um, the, the question is one of beauty. Of course, these are beautiful. And then Giotto, who's a generation later, 1267 to 1337, during the time of Dante, um, you can see his style. And we don't have time to go into all of these with the detail that they should have. But um, this was at the time when um, St. Francis was being made a saint and uh, the Giotto would paint the life of St. Francis. So we'll go back to now Raphael and I'm going to show you a sequence and I'm not going to say anything more. I'll just let these speak for themselves. If I say anything, it's just the name of it. This is the small Cowper Madonna, the Grand Duca Madonna, Madonna della Tenda, Alba Madonna, Virgin and Child with St. John the Baptist, Madonna of Belvedere, just a close up of her, Madonna della Cardellino, Madonna Dio Tavelli. Bridgewater Madonna, the Constabile Madonna, the Nicolini Cowper Madonna, and lastly, the masterpiece, the Sistine Madonna. Now I'm going to go backwards. What do you see here in the movement? Yes, a figure eight, a lemniscate, the child moving around the Madonna. And this one, quite amazingly, Raphael has painted the unborn as the clouds 
in the background. And so the paintings we saw, saw the, the child in these various positions. It's also famous not only for Madonnas, um, but this is a portrait of Bindo al Fatiti, and it was painted in the years 1512 and completed in 1515. Notice the elegance of his attitude and the remarkable lighting. His skin has a glowing luster. The shadows are soft, all suggesting a theme of androgyny. Why? Were some of the Renaissance artists aware of the esoteric knowledge of the androgynous future of humanity? Was this known to Freemasonry and perhaps to the Knights Templar? What other artists of this era painted portraits with an androgynous scene, androgynous theme? <laughs> and several did. This one is by Leonardo da Vinci of John the Baptist. And you'll also notice the two fingers pointing at his heart, one, from one. So now we need to take up strength in Michelangelo. So in 1488, Michelangelo Bunarati was apprenticed to the master painter Domenico Ghirlandaio in Florence. The next year, when he was 14 years old, he was referred to Lorenzo de' Medici, who had asked Ghirlandaio, and Ghirlandaio operated the largest artistic workshop in Florence, who his two best pupils were. And Michelangelo, of course, was one of those two. For the next two years, Michelangelo lived and worked and studied amongst the greatest humanists and what was the epicenter of the rebirth of humanism and the study of all things classical, right there in the Medici Palace in Florence. It was also while here that Michelangelo took instructions from the great sculptor Bertoldi, who had been a student of Donatello. Well, under the tutelage of two of the greatest masters in Florence, much of Michelangelo's education came from his daily observations of what he saw and observed from his personal study of the art already present in Florence. So I'm gonna make an example of a pen and ink chalk that he did while observing the painting by Massachusetts, Masaccio at the church of Santa Maria del Carmen. And here you see that painting and here you see his sketch. It's called the tribute of money. And he was 15 years old when he drew this sketch. Look at that amazing talent that he already had. By the way, this is a scene from the Gospel of Matthew in which Jesus had directed Peter to find a coin in the mouth of a fish and to use that coin in order to pay the temple tax. And like many artists before him, Michelangelo put himself into this scene as this horseman with a blue turban. Do you see the blue turban with a red circle around it? There is. Michelangelo himself. In this tanda called Doni Tanda, we have the Holy Family with John the Baptist in the background. How do you feel when you look at this compared to Raphael's very similar painting that you see to its left? One of the things that struck me and maybe because of all of the nudes in the background and so on, is this sense of muscular strength that you see. And here we see muscular strength when he painted the Sistine Chapel, where this is from. 
So we've examined the question of the human being through the works of three Renaissance painters, painters who embodied into their works wisdom, beauty, and strength. Where does this exploration flower next? Well, I forgot to show you Michelangelo's paintings of the Sistine. So before we get to that question, let's just take a look at the Sistine Chapel and some, and some close-ups of those. Here is the last judgment scene and look at how he depicts muscles and so on and strength in the, these characters. And here's some sketches he did, studies in strength. And I mentioned his sculpture works very early. These, this is what brought him fame. And even here in his David, you can see some strength, but he, he was fighting Goliath, who of course, um, had he sculpted Goliath would have been even more so. So David, as a boy, he's trying to depict that youthfulness and um, intelligence and so on. Uh, and in his Pieta here, you see the body of Christ and the Madonna. And a close-up of that face of David. And again, the battle with the centaurs and the battle of Cassina, which is now lost, unfortunately. But here you continue to see his, um, in his expositions, this painting of strength. So to that question, we can say that wisdom, beauty, and strength, of course, are related to head heart and hands. And because of the Luciferic seduction, the whole process of evolution was altered. I'm quoting Steiner from the fall of, of the spirits of darkness, lecture six. And that's part of GA 177. The outcome was that this whole more elemental body condensed to become the rest of the human body, which of course, also had an effect on the head. This will give you an idea of the true nature of the human being. Apart from the head having come from earlier evolution, human beings would be an outward manifestation of the Elohim if their bodies had not become sensuous flesh. It is entirely due to the temptations of Lucifer, that this outward manifestation of the Elohim has condensed to become flesh. Something very strange has arisen as a result. An important secret to which I have referred, I meaning Steiner, referred a number of times. What has happened is that the human being has become the image of the gods in the very organs which are normally called the organs of his lower nature. This image of the gods has been debased in human beings as they are on earth. The highest principle in human beings, the spiritual principle coming from the cosmos has become their lower nature. Please do not forget that this is an important secret of human nature. Our lower nature, which is due to Lucifer's influence, was actually destined to be our higher nature. This is the contradictory element in human nature. Rightly understood, it will solve countless riddles in the world and in life. I hope the society meetings that we commence in our future, I, sorry, end of quote there. And now I'm just trying to say that as we are looking at the next hundred years for the society, I hope we can take up these issues of wisdom, beauty, and strength in such a way. And I think the time has come for a Renaissance 
Not that Steiner brought it, but that Steiner brought the inspirations for that. And that should be part of our anthroposophical future. For those who want to read more on this, I'm showing you three books, The Uncomfortable History of Christianity, Why Leonardo Abandoned His Adoration of the Magi, and The Hidden Heretic of the Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci. And more uh, presentations and uh, studies are available at thechristianmysteries.com. So now we can enter into your questions. And as we move to that phase of this, I'll just mention this quote from Angela Silesius. If Christ were born in Bethlehem a thousand times and not in thee, then art thou lost eternally. And from Steiner, it is not I, but Christ in me who allows me to live again in the spiritual life of the soul. Thank you all 